Okay, so the recording is on now. And good morning, everybody. I'll uh, try to keep um, admitting people as we go to, uh, to one and all and to your families a safe and, and very happy Christmas. So um, I trust we're all well. So this will be the final webinar for the year. It's been an interesting year. Uh, and as always, please ask questions and, and whatnot on the, uh, the chat, chat box on the side. But um, I, I trust everyone's well, you're looking well. So what I'm gonna do now, um, if you wouldn't mind, just tell me if you can see the agenda page with the holly on it. Can everyone see that? That's good. So I'm going to, uh, to do a bit of a quick update because China's continuing to make everything very colorful and interesting. Uh, look at where markets are just briefly, but then do a bit of a rehash of uh, the year that's been. Some of the things we got right and one or two of the things we didn't. But feel free to sort of ask questions as we go. I think you've all listened to me enough to know we can do this upside down underwater for 12 hours without drawing breath. So uh, there's nothing can throw us off here. Just quickly, we'll try to keep this under 30 minutes. Please ask questions via the chat box. Uh, the, um, the content today is as always, it's general in nature. So very quickly, uh, markets are in very good shape. We're near all time record highs again. So over the course of 12 months, we're actually marginally above where we were 12 months ago. And 12 months ago was almost at a record high. I think we're about two or 300 points short of the record when you look at the All Ordinaries Index. So it's a great story. That's come back probably surprisingly quickly given everything that's going on, but it's on the back of all the money that's being printed and also the, the quantitative easing and sorry, the antivirus, the vaccine that's coming out now and seems to be uh, looking very promising. Just wanna talk about this guy. I imagine many of you know who he is. This is Mr. Buffett, uh, arguably the world's greatest and most well-recognized investor, Warren Buffett. He's been around for a long, long time and a lot of what I'm gonna to do today is to probably just pat my clients on the back, if that's okay, because you've all taken, the, uh, taken our advice and just hung in there. You've all listened to us, you've all made good decisions and we're very grateful for that because it makes our job easier and as well as protecting your outcomes long-term. So Warren Buffett went through the 1987 stock market crash. He, he went through the Gulf War crisis. He went through the, the GFC in 2008, the dot-com bubble earlier than that. In all of these times, there's a few facts were, were very self-evident. Rule number one, don't lose money. It's particularly important when you're a retiree to not lose money. It's easier when you're 25 and the markets can go up and down, you've got a chance to rebuild. But once you're in retirement phase, the, the consequences of losing money are much greater because you simply can't rebuild it or it's much, much harder to rebuild it. Rule number two, get scared. People get scared when they don't understand what's going on or where the, where the problem is coming from. Rule number three, someone's sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long, long time ago. And that's a really important one to understand here that even if you're in retirement, you've still got another 20, 25 years to plan for. And, and the best retirements start when people are in their 40s, when they actually start planning for them. So long-term thinking is a critical element here. And when you combine it with the previous point, which is about understanding what's going on, it makes a big difference. And the final one is when the media tells you to be scared, you should generally speaking, go in the opposite direction. The media is very, very good at trying to scare you for no agenda other than to get your attention. They don't care for the long-term consequences. They don't care what the impact is on you. All they want to do is to get your eyeballs on the, on the phone or on the screen. And so when the media is crowing about how good things are, get nervous. When the media is crowing about how bad things are, that's the opportunity to actually look at maybe it's the time to get invested. So if we look at the way we construct your portfolios, and again, big pat on the back for all of you because each and every one of our clients, I don't think we've had anybody panic and get out. You've all sat there and said, actually, we do have a plan in place. So when we look at the way we construct portfolios, we could chase the highest return for our clients, which means, and you've seen it this year, massive risk. We could, on the other hand, chase the lowest risk for our clients. And these days of basically 0% interest rates means no earnings. 
the better outcome is to chase the highest certainty of income. And this is how we construct your portfolio. What we look to do is to give you four, five, six years of income so that your portfolio can write out the rough periods. And this year has definitely been a rough period. So we do that by putting one to two years in cash. We put another two to three years in bonds, giving you somewhere between normally four and five or six years in low risk stuff. And that allows us to keep these other assets having their ups and downs. And this is this time thing. If you give it time, it will recover. And it certainly has this year. Now, the key part of one of the things we do for you is identify when it's time to take profits from the growth side to fatten up the left-hand side of the equation. And that's been working. In fact, uh, if I can, if you'll allow me to pat Chris Neal on the back in particular in our office, but all, all the advisors are on board with this, about two or three years ago is when we started to take profits in a substantive way with most of our clients and fatten up the low end of the bell curve. We didn't know that the COVID year was coming. What we knew is that we'd had five, six, seven good years and you just can't keep going that well without there being a down year. And so by fattening up the left-hand side of the graph, each and every one of you has had a, the opportunity to write out the volatility on the right-hand side. So patience is the key. As I said, downturns are inevitable. Rewards long-term thinkers and hurts short-term panic, not picnickers, it's a typo. Rewards short-term panic, it, it harms, it hurts short-term panickers. I, I, I love throwing, showing this graph. This goes back to 2004. A ten thousand dollar share portfolio in the Australian share market. It went up very nicely to the peak of two thousand and eight. If clients panicked at that point and got out of the market because they just couldn't bear the strain and the stress, then as a result of that, they waited until there was a signal that it was a good time to get back in the market, and they missed out of the ensuing twelve years of returns. They missed the forty best days, which is about one percent. So they're in the market 99% of the time, nothing happened. The 1% of days when all the magic happened meant there'd be a difference of between 9,300 for the person that got out and waited for a signal and the person that just let the quality managers do their job would have had $40,000. And the difference there is $31,000. So this is just to totally reinforce the messages on the earlier slides and to validate the choices you've been making because not only has history taught us this, the last 12 months has taught us this, that things might be you know, uncomfortable and uneven, but what we need to do is to ride it out because the governments of the world and the stock markets of the world know it's uncomfortable as well and they're doing things to fix it. So uh, I'm not gonna show you any COVID-19 graphs. I think we all know we live in the best country in the world and for mine, the best state in the best country. And again, the best region of the best state in the best country of the world. There is not another place I'd rather be right now, notwithstanding a desire to take a holiday or two. Australia has proven itself to be quite simply the lucky country. And for some reason, China doesn't like us very much. So let's talk about that and see where this is headed. First thing I want to do is point out the iron ore price, pretty much from the beginning of the COVID-19 panic, right? This was the point where Australia said to China, well, you need to explain yourself. How did this thing come out of Wuhan? And from that moment on, when China started to resist, the iron ore price has gone through the roof. The reason that's happened, and it shows up in the steel price on the next, next chart, the, the reason that's happened is the entire world knew that the government would not sit idly by when COVID-19 was happening. And the government, the purpose of government is to tax in the, in the good years so that it has money to, to fund and soften the bad years. So what's happened ever since February, March is the entire world has known that the government was going to invest in infrastructure. You cannot build infrastructure of any kind without steel. It just so happens that Australia is the largest exporter of iron ore in the world. And it's really interesting to note that it doesn't matter what China's saying, they're still buying our iron ore and the iron ore price is hitting record highs. So we're, we're now up very close to the highest prices for steel in quite a long time. And that's a very positive sign because you can't have cars, you can't have computers, you can't have fridges, you can't have telephones, you can't have anything without steel. And likewise, you can't have it without coking coal and you can't have it without energy. And it's really interesting if we look at the oil price, 
after crashing down very low, it's now back up to $50 a barrel, which is where the American economy makes good money out of oil. Americans needed the oil price somewhere between $30 and $40 a barrel. That's why it's settled around 40, but it's now recovering off the back of belief that the economies all around the world are gonna do well. And what I'm really doing today is showing you a rehash of some of the slides that we've, we've looked at over the 12 months, because for better or worse, things have worked out pretty much the way we predicted. Uh, it's probably not good for my ego, but it has been good for the client's portfolio to know that things are behaving themselves, which is good. So again, we're seeing the oil price climbing. Really interesting one. I went looking for this because I'm, you know, it's, it's hard not to ignore the fact that China's behaving like a bully. This is the beef price. We all know what China's are doing to our, you know, rural industries. But this is the beef price from a website called MLA.com. Going back to January, it peaked up into March and then it crashed a little bit. But from the moment, the moment COVID became a thing, the beef price has climbed again. Now that's, I think it's up around 800 cents per kilo or $8 a kilo for a steer at, at auction. And when you compare it to the previous two years, 2018, 2019, we're arguably up somewhere in the order of 50 to 60% on the beef price. So again, the media, if you, if you listen to the headlines, the media is saying China slaps tariffs on Australian beef. What they didn't say was that the beef industry is struggling because they don't want that story because it's not quite as scary because it's not, it doesn't appear to be struggling. Likewise, our coal industry is doing fine. If, you, uh, if we look at coal here, the coal prices, particularly since, uh, this, since September when, the, when they talk, started talking about antivirus or vaccines, the coal prices skyrocketed up by about 60%. Now that's a combination of two factors. One, the Northern Hemisphere is entering into their winter so the demand for coal goes up, but also the, the confidence in the coal industry and the economy is actually rebuilding. I'm not gonna make any comments about climate change or anything like that. What I'm simply saying is that Australia makes money on coal at 50 to $60 a tonne. At the moment, the coal price is up higher than that. So that's a very positive story. And I didn't, I couldn't find any figures on barley. I hope that's okay. Nor could I find many figures on wine. They don't publish the data quite as much as they do for iron ore and coal and, and gas and so forth. But our predominant exports are actually seeming to hold up quite well. And again, I, I am such a fervent believer in this country. We produce the best food in the world. We produce the cheapest and most reliable energy in the world. We produce the best iron ore in the world. 62% of all the iron ore China imports comes from Australia. The next 22 or 23% comes from Brazil. Brazil's a mess. China can talk all they want. So when you actually have a look at what's going on in China, and those of you that tune in regularly remember this graph, China isn't actually surrounded by very many friendly neighbors. Uh, the, the neutral ones are, are Russia and a, a few uh, countries in Thailand and uh, Malaysia. But these green countries being South Korea, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, India, Australia, New Zealand, they're all part of an axis aligned with North America, which is not, not standing or not accepting China's rhetoric, not, not, acknowledging that China can do no wrong. I, I have no issue whatsoever with Scott Morrison saying to China, you appear to have created this problem. You need to stand publicly and acknowledge it. Now we all know that the Chinese are, are very much about saving face. And there is no way that the Chinese are ever going to subject themselves to intense external scrutiny. So what they're doing is ramping up the rhetoric. Now, when you look at what's happening with China right now, the first thing you need to understand is all the words are for domestic consumption. It's all about China maintaining its power base at home. Xi Jinping and all this sort of stuff, it provides an opportunity for the domestic politics to attack the ruling junta. And what they're doing is creating an enemy out of the rest of the world for two reasons. Firstly, while they're busy yelling at Australia about sanctions, 
they're not being held accountable for the source of the virus in Wuhan. And the second thing is they're distracting their own internal media and internal population and pop popularity into a conversation about how offensive Australia is or America or Donald Trump is. My prediction is this is really all about the, the, the communists in China maintaining their power base, particularly when you realise that they're actually struggling a little bit with uh, the South China Sea agenda. But what they want is to focus everybody away from their own internal problems. Now, my gut instinct here is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have already been awarded Times Person of the Year. I'm not sure how two people get it, but they're the Person of the Year. Uh, my gut instinct here is China's going to dial this rhetoric up for another couple of months and they're going to create more and more disharmony and then someone like Donald, uh, Joe Biden is going to bring everybody to the table and China's going to be the, the bigger man and they're going to put aside their legitimate grievances with Australia and they're going to sit down and they're going to work out a trade deal because it makes absolutely no sense. China cannot buy coal from other parts of the world of the quality of Australia. The stuff that they make in China and Mongolia is inferior. They're not getting enough coal from America because they're just as angry with America as they are with Australia. They're not getting it from Brazil because they have all sorts of problems. So China doesn't benefit from this agenda. What it does is it benefits the ruling Chinese Communist Party. So be patient with this because inevitably, rule number one in life is follow the money. And it serves no one's agenda for China not to be a well-respected member of the international economy, which is exactly where they're running away from at the moment. So this is all talk for mine. So not, China needs these cordial trading relationships with the Western world. Doesn't matter what they're saying, they need it. Which is why when you look at what the media is doing in Australia, they're trying to make this a big thing. They're trying to make China against Australia a big problem, but Scott Morrison's not saying much. They're saying a little bit on TV, saying, no, we want to work with you guys. But they're not actually going to war with China because China doesn't want a war. China wants a headline. Now, uh, we'll move on from that. Oh, it's just this final point, that having made a problem, manufactured a problem with the, the relationship with the countries, it's going to be China that then goes and solves it. They'll come to the table and they'll negotiate from a position of strength. And I, I genuinely expect that by Easter, but I've got to admit, I'm, I'm guessing there. It just doesn't make sense the way they're behaving. I do want to look at Australia though. A couple of nice figures here. And I maintain this time and time again, it's the place to be. These are the figures from the Reserve Bank. So we had two negative quarters of economic growth, a little one in March and then a big nasty one through June. That's a minus 7%. There's a fantastic podcast which if, if you're into right-wing thinking I recommend a podcast called The Delling Pod it's a British podcast but there was a chap on there the other day a guy named Andrew McLeod who's a professor I think at Monash University or somewhere like that and, and this guy is a fairly left-wing thinker he makes no apologies for it but he made a really really good point the other day about the response that the, in this case, call it three major democracies of Australia, the UK and, China, and America have had to the, uh, the COVID crisis. Now, Australia, despite our rhetoric as a, um, a devil may care country, we're actually really quite cooperative. If it makes sense for us to behave like good little Vegemites, we will behave like good little Vegemites. And so Australia's worst economic outcome from the COVID-19 was a minus 7% hit to GDP. That was inevitable because of the problems of COVID. Now, the UK did not respond as well as Australia. They didn't shut down. They didn't try to curtail commercial activity like Australia chose to do. They were down minus 12 or minus 13%. And then in the extreme right, you go to the libertarian country of America where they live, die or free, they live free or die where their, their sole agenda is to maximise their own freedom and independence and hang the rest of the country. And they had a minus 20% hit, hit to GDP. Now, what's really interesting here is not, and I'll admit to being fairly right-wing, I think the reaction to COVID has been more intense than it needed to be, except for the fact that not everybody in this country thinks like me. 
There's a large percentage of the world want to be safe. I'm more of a risk taker. I own my own business. I'm inherently more willing to carry the burden of my own mistakes. But when you look at the nature of the world political field, if you assume that people are 50-50, half of the people want to play safe and the other half of the people are more libertarian, the further that the country went down the path of stuff it will just let the economy be the key priority, the worse the economic impact was on the country. So as much as I am, you know, you know, pro-business, pro-right wing, it turns out that I was wrong. That the best way to navigate an economic story here for a, for a pandemic like COVID is to be fairly brutal with the shutdown because people will remain confident if they're seeing fairly strong responses. If they're seeing weak responses, people stop spending money. People stay at home. And consequently, the damage to the world economy is greater the more laissez-faire you are about the COVID response. Even though I do believe it's, it's, it's a nasty flu, it's a nasty cold virus. I do believe that we should have been locking up our old people, not, not the entire country. But it turns out that most people in this country don't think like me. Most people in this country actually want strong leadership. And as a result, Australia's had just about the best economic response in the world. And again, the place to be. Best country in the world, best state in the country, best region in the best state. I am so proud to be an Australian at the moment. And I, I'm saying that because I'm trying to be positive. But when you compare the rest of the world, and you think, okay, yeah, we've got a lot we can do better. But my God, we're better than most. So as it turns out, the Australian response turns out to have been the correct one that degree of shutdown was the correct one. Could we do better? Yes, we can, but most, if not all, have done worse. Now let's have a quick look at housing. Okay, the great Aussie dream, because in my view, it's about to take off. A house prices are driven by four factors, interest rates, immigration, income, income being rent you get from your house and also general wages of the population, and finally inflation. Now, to be honest, Inflation is linked to rent and wages. Inflation is 50% income anyway. And what we found just recently, and forgive the fuzziness of this graph, but this is a very good graph, it shows that the housing sentiment is as high as it's been almost in a decade. Last time it was as high as in 2011-12. Now that's a very positive story. That means people are wanting houses, people are wanting to buy houses. And let's not kid ourselves. The governments of the world are printing somewhere north of $10 trillion in response to this COVID problem. That money has to go somewhere. It does not sit in the bank because the bank accounts are earning no interest. Excuse me. So the, 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 the sheer amount of cash that's out there is going to go into the banking system. The banks are going to lend it to people and people are going to be faced with a choice. I could leave it on term deposit and earn nothing or I can go and buy an investment of some kind. And the two investment choices that are available to the mass market are property and shares. It's as simple as that. International shares, Australian shares, this type of share or that type of share, but still shares and property. Now, what we're seeing after an initial collie wallop, we're seeing a strong recovery in the housing sentiment. That's a really positive story. Here's an interesting graph. If we look at the history of Australian residential property, and this is the average of the eight capital cities of Australia since 1982, starting with a reference point of one, it's now you know, 45 or 44, 4,500% uh, higher or something like that. The bit that's really interesting is when you look at the cash rates. Now, this gradual decline in interest rates has married almost perfectly the increase in the value of housing. So if we look here, falling interest rates, rising property prices. Falling interest rates, rising property prices falling interest rates, rising property prices. But look between the bars as well. Sometimes it's growing as it has been there, but most of the time when interest rates are, are high, the property prices are flat. So we see it right here when interest rates started to creep up again 10 years ago. Again, this period here from 2013 to 2018, property prices grew and then it flatlined again and property prices flatlined again. And we're seeing it just lately where interest rates again are falling and property prices are going up. So in my mind, I know that virtually all of you are not buying any more houses, but if, you are, you know, if you, your kids and grandkids are thinking about it, there's a lot of information pointing in the direction of the houses growing in value. So it's not a bad idea for your kids 
or grandkids to look at buying their first house. Now, I haven't put a slide in on this, but I want to talk to in inflation. Back in 1990, Bill Clinton was president and Bill Bernanke or whatever, whoever it was, was the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve in America. And after the recession that the world had to have, which is that sort of Paul Keating quote from the early 1990s, they decided to stop managing for economic growth. And they started to manage to keep a lid on the inflation rate at about 3%. Now that period coincided with the transfer of manufacturing capability in the Western world to China and to Mexico and places like that. And so what they saw was very low inflation rates and that's been a good thing, but they also saw no wages growth, which is why there's this chap, I don't know if you've heard of him, his name was Donald something, got elected in America, right? He, he got elected on the pretext of he's going to make people's lives great again. He's going to get their wages up again. Now, the irony, of course, is that this is actually what's about to happen because the, they discovered that the economic growth kind of flatlines when the inflation rate flatlines. And because they did all they could to export the economies overseas and then the computer technologies and all the changing of the economic models, after 2005-ish, there really wasn't a lot to do in turning America into a manufacturing powerhouse again. So they needed to turn America into a services powerhouse, much like Australia with our, uh, our education and our hospitality and things like that. But that's proven to be very difficult. So the Federal Reserve met in August this year and they said, okay, we're now going to allow inflation again. We're going to allow inflation at up to five or 6%. Now that achieves two or three things. Inflation is 50% wages. So to allow a five or 6% inflation rate means to expect a five to 6% increase in wages. What that's going to do is increase people's confidence, which means they will start to spend more money on cars and carpets and houses and holidays. It will also mean that the size of the debt that the governments have will start to shrink because inflation expands the economy and it shrinks the debt. So there's two ways to deal with debt. One is to either pay it down or the other one is to increase the value of the underlying assets. So in, the, in government terms, it's called GDP. GDP will increase when wages increase and spending increases. So what we're going to see now is a period I suspect of at least five years where interest rates will stay very low and the government's gonna do a lot to increase wages. Because if you feel wealthier, then you like the government, which means they get reelected. So we're in for a scenario now where inflation is about to start to climb, wages are about to climb, and they're going to allow a lot of these arbitration commissions and things to go for fairly strong claims. That's gonna put a burden on uh, businesses and things like that, but the government's always got to thread that needle to a certain extent. Now, the other thing that's going to happen is migration. So this is a graph of the migration in Australia on the, on the left-hand side. So if you go back 50 years ago, we were getting 50 to 100,000 people a year. It peaks, and this is actually net migration. There's 50,000 people leave this country every year as well. So if you put them back in, you talk about how many immigrants are coming in, we're seeing somewhere in the order of 250 to 300,000 immigrants a year coming into this country. Now that's stopped. Stone Cold stopped with COVID-19. But the minute they get vaccines working, the minute they get the flights coming in again, you're going to see a lot of people, and I predict a lot of people from Hong Kong. And to be honest, I don't mind that because the Hong Kong, the, the Cantonese are highly educated. They've got a great work ethic and they just want what we want, which is to, to, to start a business and to become wealthy and to own property and to educate their children. It's completely in alignment with the Western ethic. So I think we're gonna see a lot of immigration from Christian countries. We're gonna see a lot of immigration from Hong Kong in particular. Uh, a lot of people are gonna be free. Now, Canada came out the other day and just made an absolute statement like this they are going to dial the immigration up big time because if you to grow the economy which you need to do to handle the increased debt that we've now got to grow the economy you either increase productivity and wages which you can do or you increase the number of people in the economy and that's what's going to happen here so expect to see this graph 
upward of 300,000 over the next couple of years. Now, if I was in charge, I'd be demanding that they go and they work in the region, they live in the regional areas. I don't want them in Sydney and Melbourne. There's obviously tensions there with that. Um, and I'd be a little bit selective about who you welcome in. There's no question about it. The interesting part here is if you look at the stock market, you see that the stock market has gone up relatively well with the immigration rate over the last hundred years. And so again, to, to create prosperity in this country, we definitely write off the, the housing industry. Um, I, I've heard that the 50% uh, of state government revenues come from housing, the housing sector. So the state government wants it, the federal government wants it, every individual that owns a house wants it. They want the house to be worth more. So expect a lot of incentive and a lot of money spent in encouraging the banks and encouraging the gov local governments to facilitate more housing, which by the way is another reason to think that the share market's gonna do well because the government needs the share market and business to do well so that they can get their tax revenue up. So if you have a quick look, and this is just a slide from a few months ago. If we look at the Australian share market, which is the best share market in the entire world, by the way, because of our focus on dividends, average returns since the last 120 years, about 13%, positive most of the time. $1,000 invested 120 years ago be worth 529 million today, which is about 140,000 in today's dollars adjusted for inflation. Australian share market has outperformed inflation by 3,800 times. And if I was, and I haven't done it here, I did it in the earlier slides. If I compared it to America, France, Germany, UK, Japan, Australia is the best place to be in terms of being an investor, being a property owner, being a worker, being a vulnerable person who's subject to um, coronavirus. So now I'm gonna finish now on a fairly positive note. And as I said, it's been a, a, a good year. I, I wanted to thank all of you for actually trusting our advice. It's certainly proven to be right. But more importantly, if, if you did get nervous and jump in and out and change things, it creates a lot of work for us. So. We've been very, very humbled by the way our clients have responded and the faith they've put in us since this COVID crisis happened. I say this every year and I mean it every year in my Christmas letter, but it's a privilege to be associated with you. And, and uh, when I show you these numbers, you're gonna understand why I feel the way I do. So IWF, I had a bit to do with this. I helped write the survey. Uh, surveyed more than 12 and a half thousand clients, which is the largest survey of the average retiree base, consumer base in Australia's history. No survey this big has ever happened before. And they surveyed Retire Invest clients as well as other companies like Retire Invest and the IWF Stable. And the figures that came back were just interesting. So 12 and a half thousand clients during a worldwide pandemic, uh, which was scaring everybody, royal commissions and bad press that were attacking who attacking us and what we do. There were protests, Black Lives Matter, climate change, doom and gloom everywhere, extinction rebellion. We've got all of this message in the media. And that was the year we chose to ask you how you felt. That was the year we chose to ask you whether you're happy that you're in a relationship with us that you're paying for. And were we worried? I'm gonna say, look, truthfully, yes, because you never quite know the truth. Uh, we were pretty optimistic that our clients were happy, but we were absolutely stunned when the results came back. So 97% of clients said their clients understand them. 96% of clients said that we put our clients' interests in front of our own. 95% said that they believe we're giving them the best advice, the right advice. Now I'm gonna put this in context. I'm not happy with the three, four, five percent that we didn't get there. I'm absolutely not happy with that. But I need to compare this with every other survey conducted in Australia's history of professional service providers, like caregivers, like lawyers, like doctors, like accountants. This is so strong. And it is so humbling that you trust us this much. If I look a little further, in terms of helping you get what you want, 93% means we help you set clear goals for you and help you get towards them, right? That, that we create plans that actually fund a real retirement plan for you and we help you get things done that you really value. Right? And again, I'm not happy that there's a few percent feel we can do better because we want to do better. I honestly think we can do much better. 
but it's humbling that you, you respect us and rate us that much. In terms of things that you think are most important, 50% of people said that the guidance we give you around decision-making was the single most important thing. Only, it's not on this graph, but only 8% of people said that we earn more money for you than have we just invested with an industry super fund. 48% of people said growing your wealth was, was a value because they believe that they've grown more money, that they're wealthier because they met us rather than had they done it by themselves creating a retirement income stream. One of the things that I'm very, very focused on is helping you to feel like you understand how long your money's gonna last and how long you can, what decisions you can afford to make. I've talked to each and every one of you, I think about financial advice being about good decisions, about putting your money in the right place, that's a tick. But then there are bad decisions. There's a decision where you shouldn't put my money there, I lost it. That was a bad place to put it. That goes back to that earlier graph I talked about with a bit of money in the low risk stuff and in the higher risk stuff. But so don't put your money there. But the one that I think is the saddest bad decision of all is the decision that you didn't make, the holiday you didn't take, the motorbike you didn't bike in. Uh, you know, all of those choices that you could have made if only someone had worked with you to build a plan, which is why... I think it was about 15 years ago I started down this path. We became far more interested in listening to you in our first meeting, in our second meeting, in our third meeting than we were in showing off what we could do for you. So I'm showing off a little bit here, but we're getting some validation here. And the, um, the figures I'm showing you are, are the broad spectrum figures for IWF as a whole. Retire Invest Newcastle and Lower Hunter got significantly above the average. So I'm very proud of my business. I'm proud of my clients. I'm proud of the team I work with. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a great vindication to hear that we, we're getting some things right and that the, as, a, as a group, the client base really rate what we do. So what do we value? Helping you get the most out of where you are, avoiding mistakes, getting you into a better position, protecting them from the un, unforeseen and helping you be better off financially. As I said, there's a gap between there and 100%. I want to improve on that. The bit that I really loved, because at the end of the day, emotions are what make you act. You find us easy to talk to, easy to understand that we listen and we really do talk to you at a human level, that we actually explain what we do and you feel like we, you understand what we do for you. So those figures, and I'm not kidding, I've seen the figures for accountants and lawyers and doctors and dentists and all these other guys. The, um, the numbers here are, are, are world changing because we finally get to go back to the, the press we finally get to go back to the regulator ASIC and we can say, look, this is what our clients think of us. Not worried about what the clients, the people that aren't clients of ours, but once they become a client, this is how they feel. So again, what I wanted to say was really, really, and I'm just about to finish now, was thank you very much for the privilege of being your advisors. Thank you very much for telling, for filling the survey in and, and, and telling us what we do right. There's a body of work involved in doing more right things and, and fewer not helpful things. Uh, but it's been a wonderful year, the best year and the worst year, if I can say it. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed these, these webinars and talking with you. I hope you've got value out of it. But I, and I mean this from the bottom of our heart. I want you and your families to have a very safe and happy Christmas. It's been a privilege working with you and... We look forward to working with you next year. Please take care. God bless. And thank you for being a part of our family. So that's about it, folks. Uh, unless anyone's got any questions from our crew, which is growing all the time, uh, we, we do wish you the best. Uh, I trust you'll all keep well. And of course, if there's anything you need or want, we'll be working up. I should have put this slide up. We'll be working pretty much up until lunchtime on the 24th. Uh, I don't know how serious an answer you'll get at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. on the 24th, but we'll do our best. Uh, the, um, I know, and I speak for each and every one of us here, and I'm looking at people like Christian and Paul and uh, Katie and Amy that have just come on board in the last 12 months. They actually love you guys. It's not that you're perfect. Some of you it can be challenging, but there's not a single person that works with us that doesn't like working with the clients. They, they really like you, as, as do I, and I hope... And I'm guessing the seminar results or the web, uh, survey results show that um, you find us pleasant enough company too. So as I said, take care, folks. God bless. Be safe. Uh, we will work 
talk to you in the new year if we don't hear from you before. Thank you very much. Bye. Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you. All right.